This is CBC Here and Now. It seems like we're being punished because we had to go away to go to work. Uh, I just don't think it's fair. The isolation requirement for rotational workers is reduced by half, but the new rules are among the toughest in the country. We've had a hundred years of just absolutely wonderful uh, Labor Day praise. They were, they were as big as Christmas. Preparing to mark the 100th anniversary of the first Labor Day parade in Grand Falls, Windsor. Different look, same message. Well, September 4th, and we're seeing Humidex values in the low 30s in parts of the province. Now, how long is that going to stick around? Welcome to Here and Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. Well, the province is easing restrictions on rotational workers. Quarantine will now be shortened to a week as long as workers get tested. But there are many workers who won't see any benefit from this change. Here and Now's Peter Cowan is here to explain it. So first of all, Peter, why are officials easing restrictions? Well, Dr. Janice Fitzgerald explained today that the situation at work camps has improved. She believes it's safe enough now to allow workers to end their isolation earlier. This is all about finding a balance. We certainly appreciate that there is a risk. There's, there's no zero risk situation here. Um, but, you know, we have to strike a balance. These, are, this, these workers make up a significant portion of our population. We have to strike a balance between their mental health and overall health and the risk in the general population. And, and I think this allows us to do that. So here's how it'll work. After you've been home for five days, you can get a test. So if that test is negative, your isolation ends after a week. But those workers are still being asked to avoid large crowds and wear a mask when they go out. So it will mean a big change for Jeremy Howell, who has spent two weeks that he's not in Alberta in isolation. He'll now be able to hug his niece and nephew. Um, I didn't think I was going to be able to see them again uh, this year in person or, or hold them. I should say I could see them, but not hold them. So very excited for that. And um, same with same with my parents and, you know, just my friends, just, you know, going back to a normal, a nor a normal life. It's it's been wild to think that we haven't been in any normality for us at all um, since this started. So, yeah, it's pretty cool to think about. But not all the workers are going to benefit from this. Uh, for example, I talked to Patrick Boland. He works here at the Site C Dam in British Columbia. He only gets a week off, so he'll still have to spend the whole time he's home in isolation. Uh, I'm hoping at the end of this four week period that uh, the restrictions on all rotational workers will be lifted. You come in, you fly home, you do your test, you get your results you want about your life. It, it, it seems like we're being punished because we had to go away to go to work. Uh, I just don't think it's fair. Now that system he talked about is the one they're using in PEI. Their isolation ends after they get a negative test. New Brunswick is allowing rotational workers to just not isolate at all without even requiring a test. Even with the new relaxed measures that they're mentioning today, the quarantine requirements are still some of the strictest in the country, Carolyn. Okay, Peter, so why not just shorten the isolation time for all travelers to this province, not just rotational workers? It comes down to how difficult does those measures make for someone's life. And Dr. Fitzgerald said today, having to isolate just once because you're coming back from a trip isn't as big a hardship as having to do it constantly. As somebody returning to the province who has to self-isolate for two weeks, um, it's it's not the same level. I mean, I understand that self-isolation can be difficult, absolutely, but it's not the same level of um, uh, stress as, as we're seeing with, with these rotational workers. So right now we're considering uh, this only for the rotational workers. Now, these new measures are essentially a test. In a month, they'll be reviewed. If they go well, they might relax them further. If there are problems, they could tighten up again. Carolyn? 
Thanks so much, Peter. That's here now. Peter Cowan reporting live. Well, the House of Assembly will open a week from Monday. Politicians will be looking to pass an additional interim supply bill so government services can continue and workers get paid. Back in the spring, government passed a six-month bill. Premier Andrew Fury won't be able to sit in the House when it opens. He needs to be elected before he can take a seat in the legislature. So far, a date has not been set for a by-election. Well, the province's opposition party has questions about the new $330 million mental health and addictions hospital. The Tories want to know why government chose a more expensive bid that will take longer to build. The contract to build the new hospital was awarded to a consortium of companies. It will be built for $39 million more than the lowest bidder and will take a year longer to complete. According to the Transportation Department, cost and schedule are just two factors in assessing a bid. It says the lowest price tag doesn't mean the highest value. The opposition is calling on the government to release all documents related to the decision. Transportation critic Barry Petten says the project should be put on hold until that happens. Tell me why. Why was it worth $40 million more to go with that bidder as opposed to the cheaper one? If that's what needs to be explained. I think the people of the province deserve that answer. This contract should be stopped now and, and let full breaks and let everyone have, have assessment up before it's too late. After financial close, too late. So it's like you know, knocking the barn after the, after the horse gets out, it's too late. So I think they need to stop now and show the document before that's done. Well, labor organizers in Grand Falls, Windsor are preparing to celebrate a big anniversary. Monday will be the 100th anniversary of that town's first Labor Day parade. But this year it will be a subdued event for a few reasons. Here and now's Garrett Berry reports. That would have been the 46th uh, Labor Day Parade as it heads down High Street past the Standard Building. Labor Day parades of old. And, uh, Fred Earl, a parade marshal for many, many years. In his day, this was the place to be. You started planning Labor Day pretty much in March month. This was a huge and tremendous thing. As a kid, you look forward to it like you did Christmas. There was prizes for everybody and there were bands and there was activities. Monday will be the 100th anniversary, but this time, a bit of a bittersweet affair. Well, Labor Day this year is uh, going to be a little disappointing, I guess. COVID has pretty well put, uh, put the reins on the idea of having traditional parades and so on. And if you're from Grand Falls, that's a, that's a bit of a loss. Truth be told, that's not the only reason. The parades have been smaller, like I say, since the mill went down. That took out uh, five major un unions in the area. And they were pretty much the uh, driving force of the District Labor Council and Labor Day at that time. Rebuilding that tradition will be a challenge. There's been a, a less unions here, so therefore less involvement here. Um, we're going to face the challenge next year, I think, that somehow we got to make up for being, not being able to have a parade on the 100th. So next year, I'm hoping community will get totally involved again and bring it back. But today's labor organizers say the movement is as necessary as it ever has been. The role of, of labor in Newfoundland Labrador isn't much different than it always has been. I mean, workers... Um, make the economy work. I mean, that, that's the whole premise. If one thing we've learned during the pandemic is that these workers uh, are so undervalued in our society. And on Monday, they're throwing an event here to keep up this type of pressure. One day stronger! If we are talking about economic recovery, then we need to put people and public services first. And that's really important. It has to be about workers and it has to have workers' issues addressed. Garrett Berry, CBC News, Grand Falls, Windsor. Well, the education minister is clarifying today that the 10 new virtual teaching positions announced yesterday are intended to help sick or immunocompromised children at home only. Tom Osborne says virtual learning is not intended to help parents or children who are just afraid to go to school because of COVID-19. He says he expects most students will go back to class. If you look at the fact we've got no community prevalence, it is safe for children to be in school. If that changes and we get into a situation where we need to move to scenario two, uh, where we split 
in class instruction time and, and provided additional resources uh, for at-home learning, we will. Well, students with compromised immune systems need a doctor's note to take part in the virtual learning. Some teachers and parents have expressed concerns that it can take several weeks to get a doctor's appointment to get a note. One well, other news, a judge has given both the province and NALCOR leave to appeal the certification of a class action lawsuit. It was filed in November 2017 by people living in and around Mud Lake. In May of that year, the Churchill River flooded, forcing the evacuation of Mud Lake and destroying homes and property there and on Mud Lake Road in Happy Valley Goose Bay. The case was certified last year and will examine whether the flooding was caused by the Muskrat Falls hydroelectric project. The outcome of the appeal could change which bodies the lawsuit is certified against. The provincial archaeologist is asking divers to steer clear of shipwrecks. This after some people from Frenchman's Cove on the Buren Peninsula started digging around an unmarked site. The wreck in Buren is a registered archaeological site, but there aren't any signs to let people know that. Jamie Brake says they try not to publicize shipwreck locations to keep them safe and says people should get in touch if they find a site that could be significant. Above all, he says divers shouldn't do anything to disturb it. There are about 6,000 registered archaeological sites in the province, but Brake says that's just a portion of what's actually out there. I took my a selfie for the first time with them in and then when I looked at the selfie I just started to cry in the, in the dentist chair because um, I was just so happy. A mysterious donor gave her the ultimate gift, a new smile. See April's new smile for yourself coming up on Here and Now. A little bit of a wet start to the long weekend for parts of the province as we head through the day tomorrow. However, a ridge of high pressure moves in. I'll tell you what that means when I come back.
Ashley is here now with a look at the weather forecast. Some nice sunshine out there to kick off the long weekend, but I can see that fog bank looming there behind you, Ashley. <laughs> Yes, it has been a gorgeous afternoon here in the east. But yes, that uh, fog bank sitting there right now. It's been there pretty much all day today, but that is going to start to creep in as we head through the evening tonight as things start to get a little bit more unsettled. But let's take a look at the temperatures today. An absolutely gorgeous September 4th across the board. Temperatures in the mid 20s, 22 degrees here in St. John's, 23 in Deer Lake and uh, Corner Brook. Similar temperature at 22 degrees. You can see a little bit cooler along the coast, uh, but 20 23 degrees in Twillingate too, but take a look at the Humidex values right now. Currently sitting at or feeling more like 27 in St. John's and Deer Lake feeling more like 31 with that humidity. And uh, this is going to stick around for a few more, well, at least one more day uh, through the afternoon tomorrow. But it is a little bit more unsettled the further west you go. So we did see some showers this afternoon for most of western and uh, the interior and we're going to see that potential for some showers move further west again with this fog creeping in as well as we see a little bit more um, moisture move in overnight tonight so that potential for showers after midnight more than likely for eastern newfoundland and then that's going to continue to spread further east as we head into the morning hours so overnight lows tonight beautiful 17 to or 16 to 18 degrees. Those winds will ease on the west coast and then a little bit in the east uh, southerlies though 20 to 40 kilometers per hour. Beautiful night for Labrador as well. Happy Valley Goose Bay 13 degrees tonight. However, those showers will stick around for Lab City and those winds will stay gusty again. So southwesterlies 40 to 70 kilometer per hour is expected through the night tonight. So tomorrow ridge of high pressure starts to edge in for Labrador and you'll see some clearing skies in the west through the afternoon, but those showers will continue for central and eastern Newfoundland through most of the afternoon tomorrow. And then we'll see those clearing skies as we head into the evening and overnight as that ridge of high pressure will start to dominate. Temperatures again tomorrow in the 20s. It will feel even more humid tomorrow, certainly in the east. We've got a high near 24 degrees for St. John's, but those humidex values closer to the 30 degree or 30 mark. And those winds will stay breezy again tomorrow. So 30 to 50 kilometer per hour winds out of the south. Up through Labrador, plenty of sunshine for Cartwright, 20 degrees, a beautiful day for you. And then we're looking at uh, Lab City hanging on to the potential for some showers and some of those cooler temperatures as well at around 11 degrees through the day. Now into Sunday, it is looking like that ridge of high pressure will be in place, although there is a slight chance we'll see a few showers through uh, central. Uh, the interior and the west coast, but it'll just be if it amounts to anything won't be too much. That'll be the case again through Sunday night into the early half of Monday in the afternoon of both those days looks absolutely gorgeous. Temperatures anywhere from 19 to 22 degrees, uh, a little cooler up through along the straight there. 15 degrees Nain, unfortunately uh, going to see those single digit temperatures and rain through the day. You'll actually note your temperatures will drop through the day, probably even cooler than that five, six degrees by the time the evening rolls around. For Monday, temperatures again, 19 to 21 degrees. Not a bad, uh, not a bad long weekend in September, that's for sure, 17 degrees for Cartwright. And again, those showers continuing for Lab City, sitting around the 14 degree mark. As we head into Tuesday, things get a little bit more unsettled for the east again, probably overnight Monday into Tuesday morning, and then we'll see some clearing into the afternoon. Beautiful Wednesday again, 24 degrees with those overnight lows in the double digits right across the board. As we head through central, we're looking at temperatures uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday into the 20s again. Same thing for Western Newfoundland, plenty of sunshine. It is looking like a beautiful start to next week and then up through Labrador. Same thing uh, with the temperatures, 19 degrees for Tuesday. However, a little bit more unsettled with some showers. And then for the West, you're looking at 11 or 12 degrees and uh, partly to mostly cloudy, but your overnight lows dipping into the single digits. Wanted to share this lovely shot of Joe Bat's arm. Look at that sunset, beautiful. Thank you so much to Lynn Loveless for sharing that with us. And if you have any wonderful photos from this long weekend, share them with us and all photos at cbc.ca.
We have an update on a story we brought you earlier this summer. It's about a St. John's woman who needed all her teeth extracted because of a medical condition and she couldn't afford dentures. But then a mysterious donor intervened. April Baldwin was so grateful she posted this emotional message on social media back in July. Two weeks ago I had my teeth extracted and someone just caught my dentist's office anonymously wanting to pay for my dentures. <laughs> and I don't know who it was. The anonymous donor paid $2,300 so April could get her smile back. And what a wonderful smile it is. Thank you. <laughs> April had her dentures fitted two days ago and she joins us now. So April, you look fantastic. How are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good. Um, it's going to be a little bit of an adjustment, um, but being able to smile again is kind of worth it. So how has it been an adjustment for you? Um, so I mean, when I went from having teeth then to not having them, I, of course, I had that adjustment phase where, you know, I kind of needed to learn how to speak without them and eat without them. And so now I'm kind of back to that adjustment where I need to teach myself how to speak again. Um, you know, certain certain letters uh, are a bit hard to say. So it's an adjustment for you physically, but what about mentally? Mentally is what the whole summer has been for me because my pain was gone. Once my teeth were extracted, I didn't have any pain. But of course, I've spent the last five years not being able to smile and be confident in myself. And, you know, I've always typically been a confident person. Can you tell us about that first moment when you looked in the mirror and saw your new smile? When I put them in, at first I felt a little silly, like it was just strange. Um, but then when I took, I took my a selfie for the first time with them in, and then when I looked at the selfie, I just started to cry in the in the dentist chair because um, I was just so happy. Well, you look amazing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you must feel amazing. I, do, I really do. I think I probably have taken a thousand pictures on my camera already. <laughs> <laughs> and what was it like for you going all of those months without teeth? That must have been really difficult. It was difficult, however. Um, I'm thankful for the pandemic because um, we weren't really allowed to, you know, go out and socialize and do all the things we normally would. And, you know, when we go to, you know, get groceries and go and do things, um, luckily we had to wear masks. So it didn't really, you know, affect me so much because nobody was really seeing it. Although everybody in Newfoundland has seen it. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. A lot of people have seen it. That video you posted uh, thanking the anonymous donor. Can you tell us more about what you were going through at that time? I knew for a couple of years that I would have to have my teeth eventually extracted. Um, but it all really just came down to money. I put it off because, you know, um, I'm a student and, you know, financially we just couldn't afford to do it. So when the pandemic started and I knew that we would be kind of, you know, locked away <laughs> for a while, I thought this would be an ideal time to have it done. I knew that the dentures were going to cost more. So I said, well, I'm going to have to just start saving my money. And when I'm able to pay for them, I'll get them, whether it be six months, a year. Like, I didn't know how long it was going to take us. Um, I had them out on a Wednesday, and then the following Monday, my dentist called me. Well, I started to cry, and I don't think I stopped crying until I went to bed. <laughs> and maybe the mystery person is watching you right now and seeing you with your big smile. What would you like to say to that person? You know, what you did for me and, you know, giving me back my smile and my confidence, um, they'll never know how much it means to me. Um, I will be forever grateful for whoever it was who did that.
Well, April Baldwin, I think it's fair to say that we are all very happy for you. And thank you so much for coming on and giving us this update. Thank you so much for having me. Going back to a normal, a normal life, it's, it's been wild to think that we haven't been in any normality for us at all. The province has cut the self-isolation requirements in half for rotational workers, but not all of those who work away will benefit. We'll hear from one worker coming up. Welcome back. The province is relaxing isolation requirements for some rotational workers. For example, workers who spend two weeks away at a job site and two weeks back home. Many of them have been either working or in self-isolation since March. And there are a lot of people in that situation. 20,000 people work away but live in this province. Under the new rules, their isolation will be cut in half to one week. They'll have to get tested. Once they get a negative test, they can leave isolation. But the new rules won't benefit anyone with a turnaround of a week or less. But for those 
it will help. It is a welcome change after six months of feeling locked down. Here and as Peter Cowan spoke with one turnaround worker about what these new rules will mean for him. What are, what are the changes that were announced today going to mean for you? Um, the changes announced today, I'm very positive. I'm fortunate enough to be out for two weeks. I get to enjoy my second week home now, pending negative results. Um, so for me personally, that's how it is, but I also have friends that only are out for a week. Um, and also friends that have, uh, have kids that are going back to school. And, um, you know, I think it's a huge step. Um, really, really proud of everyone in our group and congrats to everyone else pushing this and sending emails. What has it been like for you having to isolate the whole time you've been home? It was definitely tough. Couldn't really, couldn't see anyone. Um, used to, at the beginning, you know, we were actually quarantined, I think, for the first four months. I think it's only the last two months um, that we've been self-isolating. So it's definitely been tough, definitely been challenging. And uh, I know for other people with families um, and little, little ones, it's been, uh, been a lot worse. I know some people have even uh, came back yet for that reason, just to try to protect their own family because they couldn't get any tests. What would you like to see happen here? I'll give you, like, my opinion on what I think would work, but it's not saying it's the best method. I was talking to someone from the Premier's office last week, and what I asked is that um, Dr. Fitzgerald's team look at other options and compare them um, compared to here. So what I would like to see start with is PEI. Uh, right now, you can come home, you get your test, and then if you're home for two weeks, within seven days, seven days after, you have to get another test. So once your first test comes in, you are negative. You don't have to self-isolate no longer. But if you're going to be home for longer than seven days, you also get another test on the seventh day. So... That's pretty much there, you know, just in case you have any symptoms and come back, they're going to prove it twice. So if you're only home for a week, one test, you go back to work. If you're home for two weeks, you end up with two tests. If you're home for three weeks, you just end up with two tests as well. First day and a seven day. So how big of a difference do you think it would make if we adopted the same method PEI does? It's a massive, massive difference. Um, they've had two months uh, working on this already. They have massive data, um, you know, for the last two months, eight weeks, a little bit longer probably. Um, to show how well this is working so far. For us, it means that you would be able to come home right away and you have peace of mind. That's number one. So with your family who are on edge constantly, I've talked to so many people that come home and their families are on edge and they're, they're afraid that, you know, if they did pick something up that they might pass it to their little ones, to their families. So number one is peace of mind there. Uh, number two, you don't have to self-isolate after you get a negative test. Uh, but number three, you're also finding a, a precaution here. So after your first test, um, and, you're, and you're negative, so it's like, yeah, we are still going to test you again a week later. We're just going to make sure. We want to be absolutely sure. Safety of the general public, safety of our families, safety of the school systems is of utmost important. But right now, test on day five, that doesn't really do much for, for people that, are, uh, that have families. This will mean that, assuming you get a negative test next week, you'll be able to be out of isolation while you're home in St. John's. What are you looking forward to most once you can actually be out in the community and see people again? The biggest thing for me is my uh, my niece and nephew. I have two younger sisters. Um, my niece is a, just turned uh, one in June. I was actually home for six weeks then, so I was able to go to her birthday um, after her first two weeks, and my nephew was born in March. So even though I was able to see them once so far uh, this year, um, I didn't think I was going to be able to see them again uh, this year in person or, or hold them, I should say. I could see them, but not hold them. So very excited for that, and um, same, with, same with my parents and, you know, just my friends, just, you know, going back to a normal a normal life. It's It's been wild to think that we haven't been in any normality for us at all um, since this started. So, yeah, it's pretty cool to think about. Well, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with me. Thank you very much, Peter. Stay safe. Canada has added more jobs that were lost in the COVID-19 shutdowns, but we're still far from a full recovery. Jacqueline Hansen has more. Nearly 250,000 jobs were gained last month. If it was any other August, that would be huge. Instead, it's a sign that Canada's job market recovery is slowing. Compare it to June when Canada added back nearly a million jobs and in July, another 400,000. But in August, the reopenings had largely already happened. As the opening slows, we would expect hiring to slow with it. A lot of workers that had been on temporary layoff has al have already been called back. Um, so those still sitting on the sidelines, um, it actually unfortunately might take a little longer to be called back. 
All in, Canada has gained back nearly 2 million jobs. That's still more than a million short of what was lost. But there are some other encouraging signs of strength. Most of the jobs added in August were full time and even sectors hardest hit by closures, including food services, continued to build back. However, those gains could be fragile. I hate to say it, but this is our lifeblood. This is this is really 60% um, of our revenue is happening on this small little patio extension. When patio season ends, restaurant capacity will be cut even further. Those 4,500 employees are like family. To realize that you couldn't bring them all back to begin with and now potentially have to lay some more off, it's going to be devastating both you know, from the impact of the business, but, but also emotionally as leaders. The next phase of the recovery is expected to be slow and anything but certain. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Well, here's a flashback. In the summer of 1971, Newfoundland and Labrador had the highest unemployment rate in the country. The CBC's Cam Cathcart traveled across the province to hear how people were coping and what prospects were on the horizon. We dipped into the Here and Now archives to bring you this story from nearly 50 years ago. Bow Waters, symbol of stability and job security in Newfoundland for the past 46 years. But by the end of next month, its workforce will be reduced by 30%, and the glow of Corner Brook's prosperity will pale. The reason given is a depleted newsprint market. It's the same story at Grand Falls, where Price Newfoundland plans a 10-day closure of its mill in late December. In both communities, dependent on one major industry, the impact of layoffs hasn't been fully realized. But the effects of one industry economics have clearly left a scar of despair and bleakness on Bell Island, not far from St. John's. Five years ago, the mining company pulled out, and the people who remain collect welfare or commute to a few jobs in town. In St. John's Harbor, the activity has slowed as well. At the CN Dockyard, up to 30 men have been laid off because of a drop-off in the workload. In the Commons, the opposition has charged mismanagement. While evidence points to a steadily depleting fishery, it remains Newfoundland's greatest seasonal employer. But in Fermus, roughly 60 miles south of St. John's, the problem isn't a lack of fish. It's an apparent refusal by a majority of the employees to work 12 months of the year. The plant now has to close. The conservative leader in Newfoundland, Frank Moores, wants a realignment of thinking on the subject in Canada's most chronically affected province. What we are going to try to do uh, as soon as possible is to uh, get involved in that type of winter works program where we can uh, create some employment at least. Now this could be uh, sawmill operations which can carry out in the winter, uh, cutting and so on, uh, boat building, this sort of thing. I think we've got to bring in some pretty immediate steps to try to alleviate as best as possible uh, the unemployment situation. But it is still going to be severe. Uh, I disagree with Mr. Benson, unfortunately. I wish I could agree with him that the uh, economy is going to become more buoyant. Uh, I think not. With the American surtax, particularly uh, with the overall state of the Canadian economy, uh, with the federal government's attitude towards unemployment, or what has been to date, uh, I think the Atlantic provinces, and Newfoundland in particular, are, are basically are in for a comparatively ru a rough winter. And uh, we'll be bringing legislative programs that will help to alleviate it. Uh, there's no way in the length of time we have that we can bring in a program that's going to cure it. It would be, it would be wrong to say so. Uh, it would be political, and, and it's too serious to be political about it. But that section of the economy showing the greatest improvement this year has been construction. It's booming. With a soaring population in St. John's, housing has jumped ahead, along with school and hospital construction. But registering highest in unemployment, lowest in standard of living, and the highest in the cost of living Newfoundland still depends on Ottawa to pump in more than half of its revenues. And the provincial debt is now over $1 billion. In this province, the weather, unemployment and politicians are most talked about. All are unsettled. Cam Cathcart, CBC News, St. John's.
Police are combing through the scene of a brutal shooting in Oshawa, Ontario today. Five people were found dead in a suburban home early this morning, a home where two parents, both teachers, lived with their three children. CBC's Linda Ward has the latest from the scene. Family members and friends have been showing up at the scene here today, just distraught, dropping off flowers, sharing hugs and tears. They describe the residents of this home as a wonderful family. Family members and friends have identified the residents of this home as Chris and Loretta Trainer, both teachers and their two older boys, Sam and Brad, their teenaged daughter, Adelaide, and younger son, Joseph. Here's how they describe the family. Kind, outgoing people, really, really nice. So just shocking. Yeah, it's very shocking. They're very happy, uh, outgoing, uh, very family-oriented people. Like I say, super kind. Um, just very, very involved with their kids and, and you know what they're doing in the, in the community. You just can't so, imagine. It doesn't make any any sense at all. No. Police are not yet confirming the identities of the deceased until the coroner does their work, but they are saying that all of the deceased are from the same family and that a 50 year old woman who residents identify as the mother of this home, she is in hospital. She is recovering from a gunshot wound. As for the suspect, they say he took his own life self-inflicted gunshot wound and they're not looking for anybody else. They don't know if he lived in the home or was just visiting here, but a lot of this investigation has centered around a white pickup truck that was found outside of this home uh, parked uh, in sort of a strange way with Manitoba license plates. Here's Constable George Tudos with the Durham Police. That vehicle that was located in front of the residence, uh, it was parked uh, the wrong way facing uh, oncoming traffic in front of the residence. That vehicle was seized by our forensic officers, so we are going to be examining that vehicle and trying to link uh, that to this crime scene, trying to see whether or not it's the suspect's vehicle, was it driven by the suspect, who owns the vehicle. So there's a lot of uh, investigative uh, steps that we still have to take, uh, but it is part of the crime scene. The investigation continues here at the scene. Forensics officers have been going in and out of this home all day, trying to put together the picture of just what unfolded here last night as this community grapples with the loss of a family that's lived here, we're told, for nearly two decades. Linda Ward, CBC News, Oshawa. Lebanon is marking one month since the massive explosion in Beirut by honoring those who were killed or wounded. A moment of silence was held at the same exact minute the blast rocked the city. Nearly 200 people were killed and about 6,000 injured in the explosion. Also today, rescue teams continued combing through the rubble looking for a potential survivor. As we told you last night, a sniffer dog detected signs of life under a collapsed building yesterday. There are multiple COVID-19 vaccines being tested around the world right now, but none has so far shown the minimum 50% level of effectiveness sought by the World Health Organization. Despite the pressure to make shots available in the coming weeks and months, the WHO says that's not likely. In terms of realistic timelines, we're really not expecting to see uh, widespread vaccination until the middle of next year. Whether the vaccine works, for how long, and whether it's safe to use are the critical issues in ongoing clinical trials. In Russia, a candidate vaccine has already been granted approval, though tests are not complete. Some senior officials within government have reportedly taken the shot. Trump has been pushing U.S. drug companies to rush a vaccine for release before the presidential election in November. Well, as we head into the fall, it's time to think about that other viral infection, influenza. Health officials are concerned about what is being dubbed as a twin-demic, where the coronavirus pandemic could be compounded by this year's flu season. Nicole Ireland shows us why getting your flu vaccine is more critical now than ever. I got the flu shot 
I think in February this year. But 65-year-old Alina Gruder isn't sure she'll do it this fall, isolated with her husband. She worries if she ventures out of her bubble to get a flu shot, she could expose herself to COVID-19. It's a worry to go to the clinic when the community spread is high. That kind of thinking, especially among seniors, worries infectious disease specialists. This is the year to get vaccinated, especially for our high-risk individuals. Health experts are trying to avoid a twindemic this fall and winter, with a large number of people falling ill as both the flu and COVID-19 circulate in the community. Seniors and people with underlying health conditions are most at risk of complications and hospitalizations from either virus, but unlike COVID-19, there's a vaccine to help prevent the flu. That's why provinces and territories have bumped their flu shot orders up by almost 25 percent. By this time last year, Canada had purchased 11.2 million doses. This year, we're getting 13.7 million. The Public Health Agency of Canada says it's the largest order of influenza vaccine this country has ever placed. Heart sounds good. But that means a lot of pressure on the doctors, nurses and pharmacists who administer the flu vaccine to meet the high demand while keeping everyone safe from COVID-19. We can't just have, you know, 50, 60 people an hour coming in to, to our clinic to get their vaccine because it's just too many people coming in too quickly with crowds and exposures. Public health agencies are providing guidance, including spacing people apart, requiring masks and COVID-19 screenings. We may also start seeing outdoor flu shot clinics and drive through vaccinations. I think this will be reassuring. Once she sees those safety measures in place, Alina Gruder may get her flu shot after all. Nicole Ireland, CBC News, Toronto. Well, if you get queasy just thinking about the bob and roll of a boat lurching through the waves, there is new hope on the water. The world's first all-electric boiling sports boat debuted in Switzerland today. We do not have any wave hitting, so the boat, the boat is not pumping and, and slamming around. It's just you really have a quiet ride. The electric powered boat cruises above the water at speeds of 55 kilometers per hour. The Swedish designed vessel has a range of 90 kilometers and burns 80% less energy than conventional power boats. The price, a dizzying $387,000.
Time to find out who's celebrating. Happy 90th birthday to Jean Burden of Clarenville. Anniversary greetings going out to Boyd and Evelyn Brushett of Marystown on their 50th anniversary. Happy 55th anniversary to Gerald and Daisy Williams of Hopal. Wishing Wallace and Betty Pitcher a happy 51st anniversary. Happy 57th anniversary to Wesley and Anne Shepherd of Cornerbrook. Frank and Norma Clark from Botwood are celebrating their 57th anniversary. Congratulations. Wishing Reg and Winnie Smith a happy 57th wedding anniversary. Happy 50th anniversary to Bill and Bertha Hardy of Hardery rather of Portugal Cove South. Happy 56th anniversary to Gordon and Hulda Penny from Cornerbrook, now living in St. John's. Happy 52nd anniversary to Abe and Lois Rideout from Buren. Happy 52nd wedding anniversary to Jim and Marjorie Cody of Grand Falls, Windsor. Congratulations to Carl and Audrey Tuffin of Too Good Arm. They're celebrating their 58th anniversary. Best wishes to Abe and Elaine Cooper of Stephenville. It's their 60th anniversary. Happy 54th anniversary to Fred and Ruby Starks of Mount Pearl. Congratulations to Laura and Frank Blundell of Gander. It's their 59th wedding anniversary. Happy 60th anniversary to Ronald and Kitty Crocker of Trout River. Happy anniversary to Harry and Janet Power. They're celebrating 50 years of marriage. Congratulations to Joyce and Winston Moland on their 53rd anniversary. Happy 55th anniversary to Andrew and Dorothy Butler of Belle Island. Happy 50th anniversary to John and Helen Clark of Bay Vert. Arch and Margaret Spencer of Marystown are celebrating their 67th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Happy 55th anniversary today to Bill and Josephine Conley of Flat Rock. Happy 50th anniversary to David and Anne Lane of Mount Pearl. Happy 53rd anniversary to Ray and Maxine Guju of Cornerbrook. Happy 55th wedding anniversary to Leo and Marion Bonnell from Clarenville. Congratulations to Lewis and Mildred Slade of Salmon Cove. They're celebrating 54 years of marriage. Happy 56th wedding anniversary to James and Daisy Ford in St. John's. Congratulations to Dave and Carol Taylor on their 50th wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary to John and Gertrude Cody from Harbor Grace. They're celebrating their 58th anniversary. Wishing John and Thelma Brake a very happy 57th anniversary. Happy 58th anniversary to George and Helen Penny of St. John's. Congratulations to Robert and Marguerite Parsons. It's their 60th anniversary. Happy 64th anniversary to John and Elsie Noble of Dover. Happy 56th anniversary to John and Madeline Hamilton. Sandra and Fred Davis are celebrating 60 years of marriage. Congratulations. Clarence and Geraldine Butler are celebrating their 67th wedding anniversary in Northern Bay Sands. Now to some birthdays. Here's a milestone. Happy 100th birthday to Gladys Abbott from Somerville, now living in Mount Pearl. Emma Higdon of Cornerbrook is celebrating her 95th birthday. Wishing Lodrick Gill a very happy 90th birthday. He's from Burgoyne's Cove and now lives in Clarenville. Happy 91st birthday to Nina West of Bay Largent. Happy 90th birthday to Edna Pollitt of New Harbor. Sandy Foss of Embry is celebrating his 90th birthday. Chesley Howell of Paradise is turning 101 tomorrow. Happy birthday. Sadie Harris of Grand Bank is celebrating her 90th birthday. Happy 92nd birthday to Alex Pelly of Bishop's Falls. Happy 91st birthday to George Will White in Flowers Cove. Happy 96th birthday to Edith Head in Grand Falls, Windsor. Happy 94th birthday to Margaret Johnston of Goulds. And happy 103rd birthday to Muriel Anderson of Makovic, who now lives in Happy Valley Goose Bay. And we do have a couple of additions. We'd like to wish a happy 55th anniversary to Elroy and Maureen Hines of Fairyland and a very happy 54th wedding anniversary to John and Daphne Roberts from Happy Valley Goose Bay.
Ashley is back with your weather recap. So the long weekend is here. How's it looking? Well, it's looking like a little bit of a wet start in uh, for central and eastern portions of the island tomorrow, but then a ridge of high pressure sets up and clears things out for the most part for most of the weekend. Might see a few uh, showers Sunday night into Monday uh, through central and in the interior and potentially the west coast as well. But other than that, temperatures will be beautiful, 19, 20, 21 degrees, and uh, some, certainly lots of sunshine in play for the weekend. It looks like that trend will continue as we head into midweek next week. Thanks, Ashley. Well, before we finish up, the Raptors avoided falling three games back in their playoff series against the Boston Celtics, and last night they did it in style. Coming to the ball. Series on the line, Ananobi got it off, and it goes! How's that for a buzzer beater? OG Anunoby hit a three-pointer in the lap half last half second of last night's game, giving the Raptors a 104 to 103 victory. If they had lost, the Raptors would have been just one game away from elimination in the Eastern Conference semifinals. Well, that wraps up this Friday edition of Here and Now. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great long weekend.